So how would you feel if you were just a kid from Brisbane who really liked music and then suddenly found yourself as the person writing the soundtrack to one of the most successful screen projects to have ever come out of Australia and still be that kid who loves music? Turning up to work every single day, kind of not believing that this is what you get to do. Well, that, my friends, perfectly describes Joff Bush. Joff is the lead composer for the international super smash children's cartoon, Bluey. He's an absolutely brilliant human being, and who he is comes through in every single note that you hear when you watch that show. I can't say enough good things about Bluey, and I can't say enough good things about Joff. He's a delightful man. You may not know his name, but you know the music that he makes. He's such an extraordinary man. And the show is fantastic. Blue is brilliant. There's a reason it's the number one show in the US. It's a perfect combination of empathy, humor, delight, kindness, and parenting with all of its flaws on the way to striving to do the right thing when you don't have any idea what it is that you're doing. If you've never seen Bluey, to be honest, I envy you. I would love to go back and watch some of those things again for the first time, that feeling of discovery I would love to have. Because every episode is truly a triumph of not only comedy, but compassion, uh, perfect scripting, and brilliant music. Everything you ever wanted to know about, I don't know, cognitive behavioral therapy, you can learn in the episode called Stories. Everything you wanted to know about screenwriting, uh, you can learn in the episode Curry Swap. I defy you not to cry when you watch the episode called Cricket. It's just brilliant. Joe Brum, who cr is a creator and the, the writer of Bluey, he's an incredible guy. And he's teamed up with a great team, including Joff Bush, this fantastic musician, uh, to, to match this incredible, incredible vision that he's got. So I first got in touch with Joff after I took Wolfie to go and see Bluey's big play uh, at the Sydney Opera House a couple summers back. I took a photo of me and Wolfie outside and I tagged Joff and Daly Pearson, one of the producers of the show. And I, I just wrote, this is a freaking amazing production, guys. You've done something unbelievable here. Now, I don't know Joff, I've never met him, but he jumped in the DMs and he says, hey, I'm really glad you like the show. And we just started talking back and forth. And, you know, that led to some emails, led to some phone calls. We've talked about doing a few other things together since then. And finally, we managed to get a podcast together, which is brilliant. I, I went and dropped in. I saw him up in Brisbane the other day at a, at a studio. It was glorious to go and visit him. Today's going to get pretty nerdy, I'm going to warn you. Uh, but look, if you're into screenwriting, and if you're into the way that music works with what you watch on TV, you're going to love this. If you never thought, though, about the way that music makes what you watch on television more excellent, you're about to learn a whole bunch of stuff. If you don't care, it doesn't matter, because you're about to learn a whole bunch of stuff. You're about to get a clue as to why Bluey is what it is. Uh, you'd be surprised to know how much Japanese cinema has to do with why Bluey is so incredible. When you hear Joff speak, you can easily hear the man that he is. It's easy to tell. And that amount of passion translates so perfectly into the music that you hear in every episode. He writes six fresh minutes of score for every episode. That's a colossal amount of new music. Most other kids' cartoons, they play the same thing every show. If you have children, you have heard the Octonauts Jeopardy theme thousands of times. It's the same thing they play every time when the guys get in trouble, but not with Bluey. The only thing you ever hear repeated ever is the opening and closing credits. And in this episode, you will understand the secret as to why if you have a hard time dancing to those opening and closing credits, because um, there's a secret dancing to it and Joff is going to reveal it today, which is pretty cool. Enjoy getting to know the absolutely wonderful human being, the ray of freaking light that is Joff Bush. Do we clap? No, <laughs> we don't. We can, we can slay. You're working uh, out. <laughs> How are you? We still slate. We still slate. You know, we we still slate. Which is, I think it's really important. You've got to slate because it's your final um, sorry, slate. We're talking about the thing the person holds in front of the camera and goes, "Take one." Click. Oh, that. Yeah, gotcha. Um, I thought you said slate. slate, and I said, "Yeah, we still that slate." We always, <laughs> we always, we so slate off. No, but we we still slate because in this world of you can just record forever. Yeah, you know, data wrangling. Data wrangling is a big deal and transferring just squigabytes of data. Yeah. It's kind of like 
if a file's been mislabeled or whatever, it's the last kind of thing of when you see it on screen going, oh, that's the date that they did this and it doesn't match the file name. So that's kind of like maybe the, why are we still slate? Everything's synced to time code. There's nothing, you know, there's no need to do it. No, but- nothing can possibly go wrong, but yeah, it's like- <laughs> everything. Everything always goes wrong. Um, I am, I'm so grateful to be speaking with you today, Joff. I honestly, uh, I am so inspired by you and who you are and what you do the fact that you're also in brisbane and have are doing it from brisbane is the sort of thing that just buoys my heart with joy it makes me want to tunnel a stephen hawking wormhole through time (laughs) and find myself in the music room of 1989 in my high school and go it's gonna be fine don't worry (laughs) Yeah, it's it's pretty wild how things this it's I think that's the wildest thing about this is it's come from Brisbane. And it's very Brisbane. The whole show is very it's Brisbane. Tough. Yeah, it's it's really nice. I, I I remember playing I you know, when this was before it was released or anything, and I had a friend from Texas come and uh into the studio and they <laughs> and, and I, they saw a little thing and they're going, What are they saying? I don't I don't understand. I thought, oh, well, they'll just be on Australia then. That's all right. Um, and I had no idea I was going to, you know, I was convinced it would never get over to the US, let alone be go so great there. It's been amazing. <laughs> and and what's, you know, and I spoke about this with your colleague, uh, Melanie Zanetti, the oh, yeah. first episode of the first episode of Blue that I ever saw was um, the one where they're down at South Bank eating ice cream oh, or trying to eat. Yeah, ice yeah, at, yeah, ice cream. At, and I watched. I was watching this with Wolfie, just going, uh, "That's that's my city. That's what that is where I grew up. That is exact. <laughs> that's a city cat." Because I mean, we're we're a little. I think I'm a 13 or 14 years older than you are, but still, you're you're old enough to remember a time when you just didn't see what Brisbane looked like anywhere in Australian culture. It was Sydney or Melbourne or the Outback. Yeah, true, true. I, They'd be playing cricket in the summertime wearing jumpers in Melbourne. I'm like, it's fucking 36. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know? I, do, I do remember a really early, like, review of, of, of Bluey saying something like these kids on a, um, in a tropical island, um, like yeah. there wasn't, like, a reference for it, so... It's really, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, that I, I think everyone's sort of picked up now, and and I've had people get in contact with me saying, "Oh, I, we're visiting Bluey Land, which is Brisbane." So you know, we've been typecast now, us Brisbaneites. <laughs> I was on holidays in Cairns with my family a couple of months back, and look there, there it was. There was that incredible, you know, all the palm trees hanging over from. Um, from fairy tale. Oh, it's, it's yeah. There. Yeah. So that's astounding. set in that's set in Cairns, isn't it? I've I've totally forgot that. Mission Beach. It's the mission it's the Mission Beach Caravan Park. Amazing. That's amazing. Oh. <laughs> that's um, unbelievable. It's so so beautiful yeah. and so authentically you know, and as someone who watches s- thousands of hours of toddler television, like I watch a lot of it. <laughs> The outstanding difference with Bluey, Joff Bush, <laughs> is that you care enough to write a new score, aside from the intro and outro theme song, you care enough to write a new score for every episode. Yeah. There's other shows that go, here's the production music, here's your you know, exciting bit, here's tense bit, here's the you know, yeah. all the kind of release where the machines all come together and become the big machine, <laughs> and that's the same 35 <laughs> bits of every episode episode ever yeah yeah and it it just sticks in your head <laughs> when you were first like that is a h- huge amount of work to write seven fresh minutes of music or yeah. six fresh minutes of music yeah yeah every every episode yeah that's a colossal workload man like it is when you were first <laughs> for that you're like oh, i can do that did you have any idea what you were getting yourself into <laughs> no I, well the, the story is like when i first spoke to uh, Daly, the ex- executive producer of Bluey, and I've been making stuff since we were, you know, 17, 18. 
And he put it to me, because we were doing another project at the time, and he put it to me as, oh, can you reckon you could fit in this little show on the side we're going to try and make? And <laughs> I was like, oh, is it, what is it? It's, oh, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's a kid's show. It's like just four to six-year-olds or something like that. It was very much like, I call it like hear a carrot, see a carrot type of music um, where whatever you see is, is where, oh, they're sad, do something sad. Or, you know, it's very external approach to film scoring. And um, Hear a carrot, see a carrot. That is <laughs> like, I want that to be, when you're Professor Bush at the con, I want that to be God help the name God. of the board. <laughs> Hear a carrot, see a carrot. <laughs> That'll be it. That's the name of my thesis. Where is your carrot? <laughs> <laughs> See a carrot, hear a carrot. carrot. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's the sound of one carrot. That's amazing. <laughs> I hadn't realized. I sort of went, oh, I don't know, um, and I hadn't realized, you know, how great it would be until I met Joe, and you know, one of the first things he said to me was, "We want to do something different every episode. We're not going to reuse stuff." And yeah, uh, we talked about imaginative play, and he just had this really like. Um, well thought out idea about making something uh, about blue. A lot, a lot of the idea behind it was already like in his head there. And then I saw some of the early animatics and, uh, and uh, animatic is like a rough moving storyboard, like a, like a comic that's moving sort of thing. It's, it's, you know, sketches. But, it's not filled out with color. There's rough yeah, edges, it. but it, yeah, you can get yeah. one. They move sometimes three frames a second yeah it's spot on yeah yeah Sorry. yeah and um or even if that um but yeah <laughs> some of them's just a, a, s- a shot of the house for five seconds and some voices and right. and but i'd seen some of those early animatics and i, I just knew it was going to be something i had to do then it was something really special when joe brum first says i want to do something every episode did you have an idea of how many carrots you would have to write music <laughs> for <laughs> i remember just thinking Oh yeah, you say that now, but we'll we'll, 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 we'll reuse something. But I hadn't seen it, and um, you know, the, part of the decision was that every episode, a lot of the episodes, focus on a different game and a different uh, philosophy around imaginative play or or development that the kids go through. And even though there's no like lessons in the show, having this, um, the the kids, they're not avert. The kids learn through the the practice of these games and, and um and so every uh episode we wanted each game to feel like a new world like we have that sort of the the kids perspective of it so if we, for example mm-hmm. there's an episode called hotel and with something we talked about a lot actually is the kid whose perspective is it which character is it it's so easy as adults to just play the parents perspective but we were going, yeah. okay, this is the kids are playing hotel. What what does a hotel sound like to say a six year old? What's in their head? You know, and then trying to make something that's kind of faux posh, but not really, and then and and play around with that sort of idea. Um I mean that's just one example. And then uh, there's an episode called Bike. I don't you do you know do you know all these episodes? I'm not <laughs> I've seen every <laughs> single seen episode. Ten times. At a minimum of 10 times. <laughs> I might not know the name of the episode, but if you tell me what which one bike is, I'll know exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So bike's the one where um, where Bluey's learning to ride a bike and, and she gives up in the in park. The park. As, and, as, as, as Bingo is, is using the bubble. Yeah, yes, and so no. they, they're all sitting, Bluey and Bandit are sitting on the park bench um, watching all the other kids try to do their little tasks, what they're trying to achieve and and their own you know learning about resilience and and all those sorts of things and they're just observing all the kids in the park and then at the end all the all the kids achieve, achieve what they want to do uh, bingo gets the water from the bubbler uh i've forgotten all, all the characters names there i'm, I'm the ter- worst bluey fan ever but they- I think muffin puts, someone puts a backpack, muffin on, puts a backpack on someone on. yeah 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 muffin. Someone climbs up a pole and grabs a ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all achieve that. Yeah. And, you know, for example, for that one, we could just play the achievement or play the th- play what's happening, you know, the, the kids are getting distressed, follow that. Um, but we, we sort of talked about it and I thought, well, you know, when I was a piano teacher, I used to teach like Ode to Joy. 
um, cause it fits under the hand perfectly. And so the, the whole score of that is a child learning to play Ode to Joy. So it's the same sort of process. And I was trying to think of how they would phrase it. Um, and then we have this little simmering, bubbling thing underway. This is very like philosophical approach. And all this comes about from these really long discussions, you know, between Joe and I in the, in this room here, just chatting about what's this story about? What's this going? And, and in, in the end, we get the child learning piano in the score gets better and better. And then when they all achieve things, we have the full operatic version, which I didn't have the budget to get proper things. So it's just me, but, um, uh, it kind of sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, you know, that, that's, that's such a beautiful thing. You dropped so much in there, which as, as some, I grew up and I think when we first started texting, we first started texting after I'd seen Bluey's big play at the opera house. And I just was so blown away as it was, I've seen a fucking ton of live performance, right? I've been to Nebworth. I've not Nebworth. I've been to fucking the Reading Festival. I've seen shit everywhere. I've never seen a theatrical production as incredible or emotive, beautifully oh, and executed as that. And I remember t- messaging you afterwards going, mate, that was astounding. And one of the things I love about this whole series, this whole show, I'm someone who never listened to pop music when I was little, a little, little, little. Yeah, right. My parents never yeah. had pop radio on, ever. We had uh, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, Mozart, John Cage, uh, Pierre Henry. Um, we, we had, uh, what was his name? Oh, Carol Stockhausen. We had, uh, I had, four, <laughs> I had 433 on vinyl, all right? And this was the music <laughs> my dad was wow. into. We had you know, like John Coltrane, Miles Davis. These were the records yeah. we would play with. And amazing. so for me, that was that was what music was. And when I started hearing pop music, I think ABBA was the mm. first one I remember. I was like, this is different. You know, I'd never really heard that kind of hook and thing When before. did you first hear sort of pop music? Was it... I, re- I remember knowing it when my cousin started singing it around about the age of five. Wow. Six. So before, wow. that, before that, and then into my, you know, as I got kind of, you know, we are bored. There's no iPhones, no iPads pre-Atari. You want to play, you're bored. We'd put the needle on the record. And yeah. I love that stuff. And so to hear how much classical music is, in, is ingrained and incorporated in the mm. score of Louis, it's such a marvelous way to, it's not Peter and the Wolf, though I love whistling that mm. when, you know, Wolf and I are going to the park. <laughs> it's not that, but it's also just having classical music in their lives. It's beautiful. Yeah. It, a lot of that, you know, decision came from Joe as well. Like he, he'll, he'll send me like, oh, have you heard the, this recording of the Brandenburg concerto? And have you, like that. And then he'll send me something like, oh, have you heard this track by the Strokes or something? Like it's, he's got a really amazing eclectic sort of music tastes and and that's actually been you know that's that's a big it's, it's makes it a dream to work with as well so there's that and then you know I'll, I'll send things like i'm thinking this is really great for this episode as well it was just a lot of back and forth there the play we had a i wrote a, a theme like a sis i call it the sisters theme and it's all about sort of coming together so you've got these two voices one goes and then the other one goes and then and then and then and then yes that's it. and then when they come together we get this sort of thing um so it's like if you if you if anyone's seeing the play for the first time, you can sort of hear that m- melody is always like ba dum, and then the answer ba dum ba da 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 da, and they come together like this, and and that's that's the whole concept between that because that whole play is really about these sisters sort of coming together. Um, it, it's so it's end. so but, yeah. beautiful, man. It's it's not hyperbole to say that the the musical backup to the script writing. It makes the show as powerful as it is. If it was just stock standard 
you know, score, pulled off a, you know, a folder that like this is the score for this season. This is what we're doing. It, there's no, <laughs> yeah, it makes, <laughs> makes no sense, you know. Yeah. Yet if you've suddenly, you know, if, if a line of dialogue happens and there's a melody that shows up behind it and mm. then when the callback, you know, there's a, there's a formula to a Bluey episode. It's okay. <laughs> Every show's got a formula. When the callback <laughs> happens in the final act, there's yeah. the melody again this yeah, time yeah. with the other ones like oh like it triggers bits um, of your brain that connect stuff other you know hitherto not connect hitherto not connected and <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, just I, it just I, unlocks stuff thank you for noticing that because i mean that's something that's you know a subconscious sort of trick and uh which is i i, I first l- learned about doing that um it's a, a real structural approach to like musical storytelling and the, uh, there was a f- the first film I saw do this was um, a Kurosawa film called uh, Drunken Angel, and um, <laughs> this is get how nerdy how nerdy can we get here? <laughs> uh, no, you can go. We can go super nerdy. It's fine. <laughs> Strap yourself in. So in that film, there's this like end scene um, where the protagonist is stabbed and he falls back and dies over um, into some laundry on a balcony and it's just this um there's this beautiful sort of sweeping score and this is like during the time where you know it was like film noir and we get this you know you usually go um you know sort of thing you get like real dark and boom boom and this one just had this beautiful like serene score and i was it was like sort of revelish sort of score and i was going why is this hitting me so hard and looks back through the film and what had happened was that piece of music was associated with the doctor who was trying to save the protagonist throughout wow. the film so when yeah. he finally dies you're reminded subconsciously of the doctor's kindness and so right. that just like hits you even more because it's like this was all for nothing what a waste of life you know the thing and the final scene we just see the doctor buying eggs for the protagonist you know like in this loving way and so you can take that into uh something like bluey and 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 think oh you know how can we seed ideas subconsciously almost early on to create the right impact at the end and how can we how does that affect the structure and and that sort of thing so it's a real structure structural approach but there's so many different approaches for writing music to stories that you can choose from, and that's one that we definitely do a lot. But it's, it's beautiful because in in filmmaking, visually, we expect that. You know, we yeah. in an opening scene, we might see curtains are closed. In a final scene, we'll see the curtains are open. Like, it has no bearing on the story, but it is yeah. it, it fires off things in our brain of going, oh, they're more open now as opposed to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it happens yeah. all, all the time. It happens yeah. all the time. And yeah, it's you know it's a playwriting thing. It's like and to to have it backed up musically is beautiful. And the idea then that you now so and so to go back to my first question, this is oh my god, I've got to feel six straight minutes. That's a lot of music. And you're you, so you're like, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna phone it in. Like I'm gonna find a the baritone sax player who can come and help me out on the Thursday. Like this is what's yeah. gonna happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Knowing that, but it's okay. Oh, here's the clues of what I need. Here's how I'm going to do it. This is, you know, you've got a bit of a map in your head. You're not just kind of flying yeah. blind, trying to trying to make something happen. Though, do you have a process so you don't do the same thing? I say the word at the moment. I'm saying the word. I appreciate that. I say the word appreciate way too much. Musically, surely there's a chord structure or a way your hands move across a piano or a fretboard that kind of repeat themselves. How do you stop yourself from repeating yourself? I think I don't. I think I, I've got a lot of like things that are that bluey esque sound that is kind of like certain chords or things that I'll use. I hope there's a, a certain style to it. Even though I work with such, I work with so many other composers as well. We 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 write stuff together, and and sometimes like there's episodes where you know I'm doing like you know twenty percent of the score. You know what I mean? But they're they're there, but. I, I like to think I'm adding my own flavor to it. And I think it just came, that sound came with me and it's sort of like growing like a fungus <laughs> through the experience of like 
sorry, I've been watching Last of Us. It's grown like a fungus, like on oh, me, God, and like a, <laughs> through through the experience of like Bluey or things like that, and yeah. or even before that, like the Family Law. I, when I was doing the music for that, you could hear some of of, of those influences, and then I guess one day. <laughs> Just to milk this analogy, I guess one day, you know, Joe Brums comes along and goes, hey, I like your fungus, and um, <laughs> we use that. Uh, amazing. <laughs> I, I, won't talk, I won't talk about it too much more, but there's this one, like the one particular thing that when it comes to integrating, you know, classical music um, mm. in, into the work is the use of Gustav Holst, like the... Oh, uh, yeah. The planets. Yeah. Like, it's... I think I did a semester on that when I was at school. Wow! Yeah, you know, that is that was the that was the music that we used to study the structure of of uh, you know, yeah, composition. You know, yeah. And I think our school had I vaguely recall our school had a conductor's score for it, and so using that, that's how we kind of pulled apart thirty two staves and saw how they, you know, that's the one we used. And so, yeah, nice. I, I think it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And 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 it is one of the bluey episodes that has little dialogue, if any. Mm. When you are presented with one of those episodes, like Rain, for example, mm. how does that? How does it change the way you approach it? I mean, those are big, high pressure ones, actually. And, and uh, like, if I sleepy time was big, and uh, the I the, all what we had was Joe wanted to use jupiter at the end i'm pretty sure that came from him i remember we tried a lot of other things we decided on doing a sort of arrangement of that with a, a composer called um i worked with a composer called dave barber who made that sound incredible as well um and uh and then we used some you know throughout we used sort of analog synths and created this sort of soundscape but um one of the things there was i think the key line was um when bingo says i'm a big girl now um and that's you know the mum speech is is powerful but it's because of that it's the idea of that age where they become independent Mm -hmm. and these and they and then they step away from that uh that they step away from their parents in a way um and the idea that of that matched with the parents saying, I'll always be there for you. I always love you is very powerful to everybody. I think it's just a, it just hits you. And I think what we did because of that is we, we tried to do that. You know, we were talking about like before seeding little themes and stuff like that. (laughs) We tried to do that with, with, with that one, like have little hints of the melody and associate it with the parents caring for their children. So mm-hmm. when they're, you know, walk, tired walking around to get them water or carry them somewhere, we ha- hear that sort of like echoing in the background. And then, you know, it's, it's that same trick of, of doing that. So when it does come out, it does hit you even harder. And But I tell you what, that, that episode was brutal um, when it, before music was on it. It was just so beautifully animated and... Um, the script is amazing, and I, I, I could have played Ragtime on it. I think it still would have hit hard, but um, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's staggering. It's a staggering episode it's because it is. I'm going through it for the second time, and it's, you know, there's nothing that makes you feel more amazing than when a small child in distress cuddles up in bed mm. and your presence calms them. It's like, I am a god. This is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like I am, I, I I brought you relief, and I am so bonded in that moment. And then mm. after a while, you're like, I need to fucking sleep, man. I'm <laughs> can't oh, get in your own bed, dude. Yeah. And then when they you get them to a point where they go, I'll never forget it. You know, we mm. would lie in bed and read stories to G every night. She was about eleven, I think. And then, well, oh, which story do you want tonight? She goes, I'm okay tonight. And that was it. We didn't know that the last night had been the last night that we would wow. ever do it. Wow. And it's amazing because you're like, oh, we got you there. But also, I miss not being that for you. Yeah. And this is what the episode was, you know, it's this beautiful duality. Of, yeah. Yeah. And, and which is, mate, I could talk about the 
but, like, but we do have to get to like the, the big, big question. All right. <laughs> yeah. Were you in an Augustus Pablo tribute band? Why, Joff Bush, did you own a melodica? Oh, geez. Um, I don't even know if I owned a melodica before Bluey. Now I have several. I should like. Yeah. Uh, they're not all here, otherwise I would give you a demonstration. Um, <laughs> I've got one. You've got one. You've got one I, that I is, actually have like the same model that you, I believe this is the that same is model. That is exactly the same model. I, I need, like, just, it's, I, I hope they sponsor me one day. But there's, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, if you've never heard of Melodica, it is like, um, it's uh, like. I need uh, to get one now. Like I'm a terrible keyboard player, but <laughs> that was that's the sound. beautiful. And you know the sound; it goes like this. That's it. That's the that's the bluey sound. So yeah. what 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 were you what were you doing with one of these? <laughs> and why did you go? I tell you what, this needs melodica. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have no idea. I think it's it's so funny looking back at the the theme and trying to remember all the process that went around coming up with all the ideas around it. And I can, I've, I've got reasons for everything, but I don't know how true they are. And because it's so long ago and this was, no one would have thought it would have been such something that anyone would have asked me, you know, about like, you know, why, why the melodica and things like that back then. And I think it was because it was sort of like a school instrument. Maybe it's something that is, there might've been something like that. It, it was it fairly is. unique and it cuts through. I can get really nerdy about the theme as well. Um, but it, Please. it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's got an odd time signature in the middle um, for the music nerds in the middle there. It's, there is, it's, it's an extra food and do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so you can actually count it. It goes, you count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. That three four five yeah so if, if every gap if you're having trouble counting where to come in yeah two three four five and then it gets back into there so it's like uh, one two three four, four four five yeah that's it and then every time in those gaps the the shout moves back one beat so it builds anticipation <laughs> to the bluey so you get it, our, that's the thing we want to build this sort of excitement up to the the title thing. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, mum, and then the next one goes hey, one, one, two, no, three, four. Dad. I'm never going to get a chance in my life to ever do this again. Okay, let's so. do it. All right, Are we, am I counting it? Okay, I'm going to a bit slower for me because I'm not quite as good of a melodica player as you. Are. Uh, it's the right <laughs> we'll key. Okay, let's right, go. Here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Mom, bump, bump. Oh, sorry. That's it. <laughs> I got oh, no, it wrong. No, 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 I got it wrong. Go. It's actually, I got it wrong. And then it's like a, it's like an eight. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Like that, yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> All those, all that, the hundreds of thousands of dollars my mum spent on music school is just <laughs> sorry she's not allowed to see it. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed, and I'm invested. And that's it. And now I put it away, so I, I I'm just retiring <laughs> undefeated. No, bring it out. This is, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of weird math in in that, and, and but the the key to that was really that. Um, when Joe said, I, I want it to be a game of musical statues that introduces yeah. um, the all the characters. It's a genius concept because you get to meet every character and you introduce that idea of imaginative play and all those things, you know, at the same time. So, yeah, so, uh, it, was, it was cool. <laughs> I, I kind of love that it's carrying on the great tradition of strange time signatures in kids' TV. The um, pinball song was so influential in my life because it was, you know, there's a bar of four, then a bar of five, then yeah. a bar of four, then a bar of seven, then you count to 11, yeah. and then you, but groove stays on the whole time. That and this one, was commissioned, like, they just went for it. Yeah. It's so, I, I never expected people to dance to the bluey theme. And the same way that 
probably I would dance to the 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 point. It's just that that pinball track is incredible, and I I forgot about how how interesting it is. It's like a it's like a it's, jazz funk odyssey. It's like it yeah. is, and and in there's a version that's a flute solo. Wow. There's a version that's a steel drum yeah, solo. Yeah, yeah, for, for each number. It's, it's, and, Bananas, but and here's the thing, mm. and this is where I'm going to tie this all together. Just the other day on this show, I interviewed Rob and Dean from the Curiosity Show, like landmark science communicators in Australia. They're in their 70s now, but we spoke a lot about how people just underestimate a small child, I'm talking toddlers, mm. ability to understand and appreciate things that adults think is complicated. Mm. Like a three or four year old gives not a shit that there's a bar of five in the middle of the bluey theme song. No, don't yeah, care. No. They know this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this idea of like, oh no, it's got it. It was weird. The beat's all weird. Do it not. No, no. Do no, it. And also it gives them permission to fall over, to not come in at the same time because no one can. You know, it's like I was trying to count it with you before then. I got it wrong. I got that wrong. So it's like, and you're right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the amount of times I'm going, hang on, what did I do there? But you see that with kids sort of dancing around. It's like it does give you permission to fall over and 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 not do it. And uh, like I never expect because there's no drums in that track. There's just or anything like that. But it's definitely something that's yeah. It's 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 really cool to particularly see young kids jump up and dance to it or respond to it in that way. Some people have said, oh, you must have done this because of the um, this study that says uh, children and, and odd time signatures, or, or there's you know there's some science behind it that I've yet to find out about. But um, I'll happily pretend that I, I did that in mind. <laughs> Mate, you are just one step closer to your honorary professorship <laughs> from Berkeley. Like it is coming. As long as I don't give any classes, everyone will be fine. <laughs> You're by you're by yourself. You you mentioned that you did you know you've done some of these episodes completely mm. by yourself. But sometimes, you know, as I said before, you're like, oh, I've got this game. It's a you know, and I don't know if you used a sample or not, but like, oh, it's about a balloon, <laughs> baritone sax. Who do I know that plays baritone sax? <laughs> did people just show up and then like, well, how does it well, happen? Yeah, there you know the Barry sax players. It's just an old friend from who pl- who plays you know, everything. Is his name's Joe Roberts. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's an incredible player, and we've played in bands together for ages. And then the violinist um, Yuka Snell is like, is, those two are probably the two musicians I use all the most. And you know, Yuka records from her studio in Berlin, and um, we're at the point where I'll send her something, and she just goes, uh, she'll fix up my arrangement, and she'll go, I just write, oh, you know that run I like? Can you just do that sort of thing? Like, and she, we've just got that such a shorthand now. And and those, those are people who are so part of that sound. And, and so many things came from, like, we don't have a budget for an orchestra, but I can get, you could play these chords, and then I'll, I'll mix it with me going, ooh, and, and playing accordion really lightly or something. And then that just becomes the sound because we didn't have the, you know, the resources to do an orchestra. And, you know, maybe that, Maybe that helps. More accordion and a wider variety of accordion. Because <laughs> <laughs> so so let, let's let's talk a bit about it because I'm fascinated with this idea of, uh, and it's happened a few times in, in my career. It's happened twice in my career, thankfully. I've been involved in like once in the music scene in Brisbane where there's kind of select group of people and crew of people mm. or kind of somehow moved through space and time linked together as we went. And mm. the same thing happened with Channel V. We were at Chan- I was at Channel V for six years, I think, yeah. seven years. And the same crew of people on and off camera all kind of moved through space and time together. And now, you know, th- there's, there's people that I call about a project that, you know, oh, I've known now people a year older than me or a year younger than me mm. uh, weren't that. But for some, there's this weird thing that happens, like a like a, a a ring, like a like a smoke ring blown out at a science show. You know, it just kind of moves through the room together. You you mentioned that you met Daly when you were like seventeen, yeah. and you were you know, like I'm, I'm fascinated with that, like that you just kind of knew each other and you went, I'm working on this thing. You want to help out? <laughs> what were you doing at seventeen? Were you the very very nerdy kid at school? Oh, this was like I I should seventeen was like my first year at the con. We might have been 18, but it was 17, 18, around there. And I think we were doing – there used to be a, a competition. I don't know if it's still going. It's called the 48-hour film competition. And 
I was just one of the very few people who, uh, I guess, saved up all their paper run money to buy a like program to record on my uh, like see through iMac, which even then was a little bit old. And like, it was like, you know, like I just had things to make scores, which not too many people had yeah. then. And so, you know, it was, we would, we would do these little um, short films and, and, and competitions and we were both, we were all obsessed with the same sort of films. Like we, we, I think we did, we did a um, version of Jurassic Park, but with magpies. That's sort of like, you know, those sort of like, and yeah. that we're like 18 and wearing suits you know, that, that they are parents suits or something and, and like pretending to smoke. Going, We've seen a lot of shit, you know, those sorts of like the, that student film vibe, which I love. They were probably all terrible, but it was just playing and, and, and making things for the fun of it. Not everybody's you. There's, there's kind of, you're one of the two people in my life that I know who can do what you do when you can hear a, a cartoon theme song from 45 years ago, turn to a piano and go, oh, like that. <laughs> and here's what it would sound like if it was reggae. You know, <laughs> like, I, can't, I can't do that. I liken it to the people that translate at UN nuclear conferences. You know, they're able to go, uh, okay, you mean that. I'm going to now, you know, translate that into this it's you and toe hider mike mills who made all the music for my my live show oh, my yeah, yeah. Incredible, I, incredible but at what point did you realize that you were you were unlike the other kids <laughs> that you could do things with a keyboard that other kids couldn't do because it's all like when you're doing it you're like like when you speak to a rhythmic gymnast they're like what do you mean you can't do 17 double turns <laughs> in front of our, you, you don't do it until you learn how to not fall yeah. over and then you do it <laughs> I, th- I think you're being real. I think you're being very generous and I really appreciate it. But I, you know, I think like I was never a prodigy kid, like in terms of like actual being a musician, uh, you know, I was like, I saw some of my old piano report cards that were all like, you know, C minus, you know, just scraping through. And then when I started, I studied piano foolishly at the con as my first thing until my piano lecturer just said, you're, you're just writing all the time. And then I look back and I was like, yeah, that's actually what I do. I just write stuff. I write music. And, and I found like a little book I'd written when I was like five or six trying to draw the notes. But, you know, put me in front of particularly some of the musicians I get to work with and I can't keep up. I'm just, you know, I, just, I go, oh, wow, imagine being able to do that. Um, <laughs> and I find that just incredible to watch. It is the understanding of it, Joff. It's like I know, the people that make the John Wick movies, right? Mm. The, the the person behind the camera mm. watches the stunt performers go, fucking hell, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. At the same time as pulling some unbelievable rack focus while they're being hoisted backwards on a crane so they can get this shot where they fly through the air. But they can't do it without each other. One you know, one has a greater vision mm. that requires this thing that they, because you can't execute it, doesn't mean it shouldn't be in the thing. It's like, no, 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 it has to be there. Yeah, yeah. And having the humility to go, well, I can't do that. I'm going to get someone that can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's got to be, this is what it is. Actually, that's it. Yeah. When you say you were, you know, playing in bands, what kind of bands are we talking <laughs> here, Joe? Um, yeah. Well, I played like, uh, I played bar piano for a, a while. Like, it used to be, I, it, this was like a bit of a dream. Like, I was going, ah, oh, I want to be, Tom Waits or, you know, that sort of thing, playing bar piano, which isn't the reality. The reality is you're playing at some restaurant um, and no one's listening and then occasionally someone goes, there's a man at the piano, piano man, you should play piano man. And then you just play piano man about 10 times a night. So, um, you know, that was the sort of things I did and I played in a cabaret jazz band as well um, called Safety Dance. Uh, with Joe, the sax player, and 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 then there was uh, it was always things where uh, that were a bit odd or had a story. You know, we'd, we'd do things like write songs for uh, that were national anthems of made up countries, very uncommercially viable. <laughs> Doesn't matter if that's what fun. led you fun. all to where you are today. <laughs> yeah, and this is yeah, the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny how that. It's like as soon as you stop trying to be anything you know trying to be a a particular sound that i'm not or anything that's commercial and just did what i felt would i want i would want to hear 
then that's when it's everybody was like, oh, I like that. I like your fungus. <laughs> Where were you playing piano? Was a bar piano? I, oh, there was a few places. There was one, well, it's actually gone now. There was one called, uh, what was it called? Um, there used to be a bar upstairs above a place called the Crosstown Eating House I played every week. And there was another restaurant called um, Jazz. It was called Jazz, I think. I that one does what it says on the it box. It does what it says on the And they had, they had this stone grill thing and <laughs> where where they where they the cook stay oh, maybe I shouldn't be talking about because they might still be around <laughs> you might have to cut it if you're looking no, up no no that's fine <laughs> no 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 it's fine I guess I, 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 what I'm what I'm what I'm wondering is you know there's the famous you know the Beatles in Germany before they blew up you know <laughs> no. that is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours at a keyboard getting direct feedback from yeah, an audience yeah yeah what do you what do you learn? From I mean, doing there was that? somewhere I would go, I rock up, and I would get. Is a lot of it's like ingenuity, like yeah. There, there was one, yeah. I'm thinking there's one place I used to play at um, where the piano was so broken. I'd get all the bar straws and um, blue tack and sticky tape, and I'd realign the hammers on the notes that weren't like even <laughs> like just to get a sound. And and I put the bar straws so that they would slide along the bar straw and hit the string and um <laughs> i don't know if i learned anything from it yeah. <laughs> that's called a prepared piano yeah, if you're yeah, nerdy yeah. that's called a prepared it wasn't a fork to uh, it was like it, it it was just to try and make it get a sound and then you know it'd be so loud you just open everything you bash it what did you learn about what people respond to musically doing that stuff um I do remember the first time I played a gig um, was they used to have this, you know, at QPAC, Queensland Performing Arts Centre, they had uh, a a uh, restaurant downstairs. I think it's still there. And they used to have a piano in the restaurant. And um, my mum was a, a usher at QPAC then. And so uh, I, I was like 14 and I got a job playing piano in the in that restaurant. Nice. Um, probably because I was cheap. And um, I remember the first one I rocked up at, I learnt all the tunes of the show that was going to be on, you know, and that sort of thing, and, and I'd been practising. And I, I rocked up and I looked at this room full of people in the piano and I just ran away, <laughs> freaked out. And I came back like an hour later wow. and I said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I, I can start now, okay. And then they, and they said, oh, you were gone, we didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, okay. And I started playing and shaky, shaking, playing, playing. I started playing and no one looked. Everyone's just there to enjoy their meal. And it was a big relief um, because I was like, oh, actually, people just want to experience. They're not here to see me. They're here to have a, have a, have a snack. So let's go from <laughs> that. Let's go from, from that 14 years <laughs> old in the restaurant I the going out center to Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Like same same show same show, <laughs> same, exactly same material. That's got to be something like that. You, we have maybe when you, you fantasize when you were learnt, when you were playing keyboard, you're like, hey, it's going to be me with a guitar and I'm going to be on stage at Wembley and I'll be doing this or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. And yet, there's your music in front of thousands and thousands of people who are just brimming yeah, with yeah, joy. Yeah. Like, what, what was what was that I like? Mean, it was. The first time I saw the play was really special because such a such a bubble here, just in this studio, you know, here sixteen hours a day and, and or whatever it is, and then you go out um, to actually witness people in the flesh dancing or getting involved and being part of it, and realizing you're just like, oh, this show is actually really loved. <laughs> it's really beautiful to see that. That was really special. That's the best thing about it. It's, and Madison Square Garden, it, the idea of it being Madison Square Garden is like a lovely feather on the cap, but it's not anything that motivates me at all. It's like the, the novelty of it is what motivated me about it. It's like this is yeah. exciting because it's unusual, not because it's um, a prestige or anything like that. I know I, we say Madison Square Garden, but it's, it's, you know, it's a Hulu theatre. It's part of, it's like not the main 
um, where the thing is. Yeah. So I just, but you know, let's let's cut that out and pretend no. Uh, it's all about the brain, dude. Yeah. It's all about the brain. So, um, oh. yeah, but yeah, to, to be, hear oh. it there, um, it was really special. But I, I was, I think, by the, that time, I was so. Uh, fascinated by, I wonder how American audiences respond to this. And, you know, just looking around the room and go, yeah. oh, they're, oh, they're not interested in that bit, but that bit's, you know, it's like, you know, it's just uh, more of a curiosity thing, I guess. When I worked there, I'd see a lot of films uh, when I worked over there. I was working, you know, reviewing, not interviewing people. Americans laugh in different parts of the movie. Yeah, to Australia. it's so interesting. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. It's, it's 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 really interesting to understand how different. And again, it's like this idea of like once you make it, it's out of your hands. And you you know you and I have you've spoken that, about that before. And that to be in the the creative process for me, and, and there's creativity in everything. You you yeah, you can run a household and be creative. You can yeah. run a small business and be creative. There's creativity in absolutely everything. Yeah. And yes, there are nuts and bolts, you know, dollars in the bank account that have to happen so you can live the life that yeah. you're living and yet it, that has nothing to do with the creative process yeah yeah at all yeah yeah and I've, I've certainly run into trouble in the past trying to make something that would fill that bank account it ends up being something inauthentic and it then therefore something that doesn't land and it creates this self-fulfilling prophecy 100 percent, yeah versus i just want to make this because it's something i fucking love yeah. and me and them are having a great time yeah. making it a hundred percent. And then just pass it. Yeah. Yeah. Pass the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a hard approach to come to grips with. And it's so important to just have, like you say, have that idea of um, why you're doing this. You know, what, what is the, what is the point? Is it to get a Grammy or is it to, is your goal in life to like, for me, I, you know, without sounding too cheesy, it's to, you know, elevate the shows I work on and elevate music and, and, and the people around me. And, and, and that sort of becomes a bit of a key word there. And, you know, it's so important to just remember that. And then I suppose that's why when you see it on like going to uh, see something at Madison Square Garden or, but there's something that's really well, it's, that's not exciting to me is as much as like, did I manage to, elevate this episode yeah it's a good mindset to have i think but yeah because you see people who just achieve every one of their dreams but because that's their dream was to win an oscar you know they really struggle with it i think you worked on a family law yeah when you watch ben law on Survivor, which is also a show you compose music for, <laughs> like, is it this weird, like, I, is the fabric of space and I time know. split apart? I don't know. I don't know if there's any of the music I did on Survivor has survived up to this point because they keep refreshing it and they take new themes. I mean, that was amazing. I'd probably not do it again, but it was like if I hear another pan pipe, I'm going to go mad. But it, but um, I. It was, it was an amazing experience and to be part of that team and, 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 and of writing, you know, some tracks, a bunch, well, I think it was 120 tracks or something we did for it. Um, oh. but it's very high pressure and very fast pace. But <laughs> I remember watching some of the seasons, um, maybe after the second season or third season after oh, that used by score and there was this track that they kept playing. And I was going, this is awful. Why are they using this? You know, this is a, this is like, they're using some light production library music. We spent so much time creating this world and they're using this production library music. Why do they keep using this track? And, and me and my partner would always like, we'd be watching it and we'd get, <laughs> be going, Oh, they're playing this again. I don't think they use it anymore. But anyway, a few months ago, I was going through the files I delivered and I found that track. And just see my partner's put her head and goes, you wrote that. You wrote that. (laughs) Nothing can say. I delivered a product that the client or the person who asked me to do the job loved so much they couldn't stop playing it. (laughs) And nothing says, and then I let it go. Then that story. And then then it's gone. Well, they I don't remember. I don't, remember yeah. I don't even know. I don't even. Am I? Am I? <laughs> I don't even know if I'm I, using using the music. Anything I've done anymore? Um, you know, the writing for that show was like amazing because um, it's such a beautiful 
story, but the pressure of doing someone's real life stories, even though it was fictionalized, it was someone's real experiences there. That was, yeah, that was, that was a tricky one. And I remember not wanting to speak to Ben for like, until I completely finished and then going, oh, right. was it okay? <laughs> you know, sheepishly going, I can't talk to you about this. I have to, I just have to do what I think the story needs and then, and then hope for the best. But I hope you liked it. <laughs> Mate, I'm, look, I'm sure he did. It went to air. So, you know, He's a legend, though. I didn't, I, didn't re, I didn't rewrite it. No, you know? no. Then when you got, a new, when you, you got this new record coming yeah. out, there's an old phrase, the old saying, you got your whole life to write your first album. You got six months to write your second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you feel that? <laughs> um, it's definitely pressure for the second one because the first one was everything to prove. It was like... This is a, it was, it's all sort of instrumental as well. And, and no one thought it would do that well. It was basically, it was expected to just take the music from the show and just put it on a, on a record. I went, a, I went a bit full on with it and got, you know, like string sections in and stuff and, and tried to turn everything into a thing. And I wasn't expecting it to do well. Um, and I remember when it reached when it reached the number one on the charts, I was moving house. That's how much I was like, oh, well, it'll be out, you know. And so I was doing the media calls like, oh, yeah, and just put that box over there. Yep, sorry, what were you saying? It's sort of like it was really, yeah, it was quite surreal. Um, and now because of that, it's like <laughs> anything less than that on this next one, it's a failure. It's this <laughs> sort of thing. And so it's, it was really hard. You know, we were talking about getting into that mindset of not trying to do things just to, just to please people or what you think will be popular. It was hard to get out of that mindset. It's not the Olympics. No. It's not the Olympics. You're not trying to be first over the line. That, that is yeah, the job. Exactly. If you're in the Olympics. Your job is to get first yeah, over the yeah. line. This, that's not this nice. job. That is not, not a the thing you're trying <laughs> yeah, to Yeah, yeah, you know, no, you know. It's, it's, not and it's not a hopefully, knife. So hopefully people like it. I'm, I, you know, I'm really proud of it. Um, and there's some tracks that I, I wrote with, um, like, Jazz Darcy who has been, you know, we've worked together on Bluey since the beginning and, and, and Meg Washington as well. Um, we've developed some stuff, so... I'm terrible at doing the plug, but, I've, you know, I th there's some really special stuff that I'm really proud of and, and, and it, it's great to work with the team and all these different people to try to make something. But it did take, yeah. you know, it did, you say six months for the second one, it did take us two years to finally release the next yeah. one and I'm sorry to you as a parent. <laughs> Don't be. Joff, I, I take it back to my earlier call on some of the shows that I watch with Wolf, like, Whenever we get in the car and he wants to hear that record, yeah, it's fine. Oh, that's good. You know, <laughs> yeah. we use the I Know a Place song. That is my I'm driving you around until you fall oh, asleep song. I've listened amazing. to that song five hundred yeah. times. And I like oh, I have to shout out to Helena Chaika who who we worked on that episode with it was a big team episode and she she worked on that episode too and, and wrote the lyrics and was like, I, I want to turn this into a song. And it was really like from, I was like, oh, I don't think we're going to have any songs on it. And then she wrote these lyrics and sang the demo. And then Jazz, who I was talking about before, sang the final one here. And it was just like, a, you know, I really have to tip my hat to her for that that and the fact that it was like, uh, it was going, oh, no, this is amazing. We, we should do this. I would put it to you, though, Josh, that, you know, you mentioned before there's things that you don't do. I don't do this. But what you do do is you create a space that these artists and these creators can lift to places they otherwise wouldn't yeah. get to because of the permission and the space and the, the, the canvas that you have stretched across the bit of wood to allow them to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. I could talk to you for a very long time. I could talk to you forever. And i got to say, I thank you very much because at one point, if, you, if you're listening, you're about to give me turn up a guitar. At one point, you were going to be a part. I was going to do some live podcast episodes up in Brisbane <laughs> yeah. and Melbourne and, and it was going to be great. But then my doctor said, um, you can't travel with your leg like that. You can't do that. You really shouldn't give it a do. So I had to bone everything. But we had all kinds of... Um, plans and we may yet we may, we may yeah. yet do that joff i, th I think uh, the big finale we had planned i think would would work would. and we i think there's it. still got, still got legs in it <laughs> i think i think it could absolutely happen um, maybe for the big variety show or whatever the hell it is that i do um but 
you know, I don't normally do this with my guests, <laughs> but I thought, you know, if anything, I could say, um, Jaff, it's been so lovely having you on the podcast today. We talked about playing piano, man, to people who were drunken eating off their plate. So, Jaff. Have a lovely afternoon. I hope it all goes very well and you find your melodic as soon. <laughs> oh, Charles. Thank you so much for being you. Yeah. Oh. oh, beautiful. No. Thank you're you. <laughs> oh, no. You're, ab- you're absolutely welcome. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for doing this, mate. I really appreciate you. are the busiest man ever. Um, no, thanks this has been amazing. And, and it's always, I always love chatting to you and I um, <laughs> hope you don't have to do too much editing. <laughs> but um, really appreciate it.